Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Elias Rohrer. I'm here from uh, TU Berlin. And uh, my talk is called Current State and Attack Vectors. Um, this, is, this talk is based on joint work with Julian Maliaris and Florian Trosch. Yeah. And I want to talk to you about a lightning network topology um, and how the, the network evolved over yeah, the last year or so and if there are any attack vectors based on the topology itself and where would you actually attack. So, of course, the Nightlink network is created from payment channels and uh, as we all know, I'll make this fast, uh, Alice can send three Bitcoin to Bob and Bob can send seven Bitcoin in this channel to Alice and they can send uh, payments up to their balance back and forth, right? And then we have, of course, HTLCs that make that secure that Alice can uh, send uh, her payment, her balance to Dave uh, securely over multiple hops. And many HTLCs or many longer routes, longer than one, create networks. Uh, and that's the networking aspect, that's the graph aspect I want to talk about in uh, this talk because as you can see here from this really simple example, there are some nodes that are more central to the network than others and maybe Charlie here in the middle is uh, more detrimental to the network in terms of routing uh, and probably he also sees a lot more payments than other nodes that are on the fringes of the network, right? So, uh, in fall of last year we started recording snapshots of the Lightning Network and we started analyzing these uh, snapshots because we wanted to know, okay, how does the network look? How is it evolving over time? What kind of graph properties does the network hold? And yeah, if we can attack the network, where would we do it? And what are uh, the consequences or what would be the consequences of that? Um, so uh, our research was based mainly on a snapshot from February 1st, but I included here on, this, uh, on the slide a more recent snapshot of October 1st uh, for uh, uh, for comparison, uh, so we can see how the network actually evolved over the last uh, yeah, eight months. And we can see that the nose count actually increased quite a bit by roughly 150%. And similarly, the numbers of payment channels increased uh, quite tremendously by uh, 130% over these eight months. Uh, the capacity not so much actually, it's just 60% just more. And we're now at roughly uh, 600 something Bitcoin in the whole uh, network. What we can see here from the, from the graph theoretic point of view of the, the network graph has now a diameter of 12. That, has, uh, that means in the uh, worst case, we, uh, we have to route a payment over 12 hops to get from one edge of the network to the other, right? However, the average distance didn't increase these 100%, uh, but just roughly 14%, so it's not uh, that worse of a change. Um, okay, and even the central point dominance in the network decreased even by 13% over that time. That means uh, the Lightning Network is now, even though slightly, but it is more decentralized than eight months ago. And for more complex, uh, yeah, network properties, we checked if the Lightning Network is a small world network that are known to be great for routing because they have a, a average, uh, a small average distance and a high clustering coefficients. And yes, we could actually confirm that uh, back then and now the Lightning Network qualifies as a small world network. And we also could f found that the uh, Lightning Network qualifies as a scale-free network. That means that we have a uh, pretty stable core with a lot of uh, payment channels and then, uh, yeah, uh, fr on the fringes we have less clustering, let's put it this way. And maybe as a consequence of that, because scale uh, free networks are known to be uh, pretty resilient to random failures, we could um, also see that the Lightning Network is pretty resilient to random failures. So, but Random failures is one thing, and we wanted, as I said, uh, know if we could actually attack the network. And for that, we introduced in our research um, uh, two main adversary models. 
for all of these models, we assume that the adversary is an active adversary and that also has a limited amount of resources, so it always wants to act as efficient as possible. And then the adversary may have different motivations. So uh, she may try to target a, sp a single specific node or try to harm the network as a whole, right? Okay. And then we ask the question, okay, if we now kind of have these adversary models, how could, could an adversary actually go about and attack the network? For one, there's the possibility of a denial of service, so taking a note offline by denial of service, and that's not even that unrealistic because in March 2018, there was actually a DDoS attack back then, even though the network wasn't that large back then, but it took roughly 20, or at least reportedly, uh, took down roughly 20% of the network, but the bug was fixed and so on, so this threat is not uh, a threat anymore, but uh, yeah, the possibility of denial of service remains. So, and then we came to the uh, pretty simple idea of a channel extortion attack. That is, could we simply by blocking, by uh, exhausting the funds in a channel, just remove it from the re routable graph, and what can we actually do with that? So, the idea is, of course, if we uh, uh, use up all of Alice's funds on her side, she cannot send any more uh, funds to Bob. And this path can also not be used for routing, right? And um, as a generalization of this idea, we came to what we call the node isolation attack, which is uh, a pretty, uh, also a pretty simple approach. Um, if we have Alice here in the middle and she has some resources in her channels, Eve could connect to her with sufficient funds, create a channel, and then uh, send enough payments back to herself, of course, so that Eve wouldn't lose any money. Um, and by and then just depletes all outgoing, uh, yeah, all outgoing funds of Alice. And then, yeah, Eve can just settle her channel, go away, and leaves Alice in this, yeah, state where she cannot be used for routing payments, and she herself cannot send any more payments. So she has to go back on chain or whatever to increase her. Uh, her funds again or build new channels to come back from this because, yeah. So, and uh, as a first step, we verified that it's actually possible. I mean, it's pretty trivial, but we built a small proof of concept with some lightning nodes just to check if we missed anything, and of course it works like this. Um, and now, the idea is um, if we have this means of attacking the network topology, so by either removing through node isolation, individual nodes and edges, or uh, by using a DDoS attack, where would we actually attack uh, the network? And we came up with three main strategies. For one, um, when we want to target the, the whole network, right? Um, there, we came up with, the, with these three um, yeah, strategies. Removing the highest degree nodes in the network first, um, removing the nodes with the highest centrality in the network first, they are most central to the network, or removing the highest ranked minimum cut set. So if you know maybe about cuts, it's the notion of a number of edges or nodes that connect the network graph. And uh, we rank these by how often these kind of uh, minimum cuts would be used to root payments in the network and uh, we rank them and uh, these then would be the first contenders to be removed because we thought as an adversary that would be uh, nice. <laughs> so we evaluated these strategies in the network and for that we built uh, network simulations based on network X and as I said before we took the reference snapshot from February 1st and uh, payment data from Ripple because, yeah, there is no publicly available data for Lightning. We had to take some model for how do payments look, how high are they, and so on, and we had to take that from Ripple because they are publicly accessible. Um, and we measure the, the success of the adversary in terms of this delta that is, um, yeah, how successful are payments on average before the attack and after the attack, uh, how uh, many nodes or what percentage of the network is still reachable before the attack and after the attack, 
and uh, how much payment flow can go through the network on average before and after the attack. So, and as we can see here, uh, for, for, for one, the, the first line, just to co for comparison, is the, the random node. So uh, we can see when we just remove random nodes, the actual gain of the adversary is pretty, in all three cases, um, pretty minimal. So we can qualify, as I said before, that the network is actually quite uh, resilient to random failures. However, if we start removing nodes that are very uh, yeah, central uh, to the network in terms of between us, or also about uh, in terms of uh, degree, the success ratio basically drops. That means the adversary delta S gains a lot of uh, advantage, adversary's advantage. Uh, similar, similarly, we can say the same thing for our reachability and for the network flow. So if we are able to remove individual nodes, for example, uh, by using some kinds of DDoS, this would be uh, great strategies in terms of being an adversary to impair the network uh, quite fast if we can remove that. Um, however, of course, if we have to uh, have the sufficient funds for this kind of node isolation attack I showed earlier, this is actually not... Um, yeah, the same thing, because now we have to have these funds, and now it's much more about the efficiency. And what we can see here is that the, the cut, uh, the cuts, uh, minimum cut set strategy, the third one I proposed earlier, is actually the most efficient one, because there we can, we don't have to remove entire edges. We can also remove strategically individual edges in the, uh, in the network. And, uh, that is the most promising strategy for a resource limited adversary that had actually uses something like node isolation or channel exhaustion. Um, so to, to discuss this really quickly. So we also had um, a first look at a profit oriented adversary that's not only trying to damage the whole network, but also tries to increase its own uh, profit. For example, another the adversary would be another payment up and want to increase his uh, own uh, fee revenue. Um, so far, we could not identify a clear winning strategy because what we found, as soon as you start attacking the network, uh, everybody loses. And if you're in the game yourself, basically, you lose with that. So there are trade-offs, basically, if you're trying to maximize your own fee gain, for example, by attacking a competitor. Um, Okay, but how can we actually counteract that? Well, I think these attacks of channel extortion and node isolation are kind of by design. That's how the protocol works. So there are no easy countermeasures, sadly. Uh, maybe you could apply some kind of rate limiting in the clients, but finally this comes down to uh, civil protection. So not uh, a huge number of uh, identities should be creatable in the network. And that's a really hard problem uh, to solve. And it's a yeah, notorious problem in literature, right? So it's kind of difficult to counteract that, even though rate limiting may go at least some way. OK, to conclude, uh, yeah, we could confirm the Lightning Network is small world, scale free, and relatively robust to random failures. Uh, it is, though, susceptible to these kind of attacks I presented. and. Uh, yeah, you cannot directly counteract these kind of attacks because they are kind of by design. Uh, we simulated them and we could confirm that they actually work uh, yeah, through a proof of concept. And we found that yeah, centrality-based strategies are great if you can remove a node, every node basically, and then you should go another route if you're yourself resource restricted. Thanks, you can find more uh, details in the paper. So, uh, a good presentation, thank you. Uh, I was thinking about isolation attacks as well, uh, as a means to uh, attack privacy. So, if you uh, uh, succeed at uh, isolating some nodes, 
uh, you might cause people to use your node uh, to send money. Uh, and then uh, you might be able to earn something more uh, about payments than before. Uh, so that's one uh, attack I was thinking about, uh, whether it's realistic, hard to say. But uh, <clears throat> I think uh, with this uh, node isolation, uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily damage the network because what it does is it creates temporary failure at this node because the node can use the money uh, he received uh, via this channel uh, in order to uh, uh, open another channel or, or do swaps or something like that. So uh, the simplest policy for this is to just uh, receive more money uh, in fees uh, when forwarding. Like if I have, let's say, uh, if I have uh, thousand satoshis in in my outbound capacity then i have to calculate the fees in such a way that if there if all my capacity is exhausted then uh, uh i have uh, enough fees to cover the cost of opening new channel and then yeah it still sucks that i cannot pay somewhere but it's not that bad i would say so Maybe, yeah. maybe a way to mm -hmm. countermeasure this. What I kind of left out is that right now these kind of channel extortion attacks are, at least at, as we found, uh, even the adversary can do them for free because of payment griefing. So that means that the adversary wouldn't pay any fees for that. He would just route back to itself and then let the payment time out, basically. And uh, until it fails, the capacity is locked, so you can do this kind of attacks for free. You don't just have to have the capacity somewhere, but you're not paying for that. And that's kind of uh, dangerous, not so much that any node is actually losing money or that individual hubs are losing out on fees, but the problem is you could temporarily at least uh, really split up the network and inhibit like the payment flows. Yeah. Uh, short question. Um, how do you calculate the uh, centrality coefficient that you mentioned in the first slide? Like in the beginning? Yes. Um, I think it's the, the average difference from the maximal centrality, basically. The, the central point dominance, you mean? Yeah, it's the, it's, the, uh, it's the average difference from each node in the network to the maximum centrality a node has. Basically. That's a common graph measure, basically. Uh, sorry if maybe that was presented, but maybe I didn't understood, but there, the solution I see is uh, probably someone who is attacking, trying to isolate this node, uh, uh, maybe can do, is by, can do it by single payment. He can do a lot of payments. To, to, um, so then um, what I see is the node that uh, is, um, is uh, routing these payments, he, uh, this node uh, see that it should rebalance channels with others. So then this node should try to send payment back yeah. through the attacker. And then when it see that attacker would like no to yeah. uh, help him balance, uh, should not uh, help him to, um, to root. I'm not sure if you understand this yeah. from my English. Uh, yes, you, you could apply something like quotas for an individual node. So would some node would just have a policy, uh, this and this node cannot or uh, cannot send indefinitely uh, payments over my node to, yeah, to exhaust my channels. I mean, right? he, he can send, but then I try to rebalance my channels. So I'm sending yes. funds uh, back. Yeah, the and question then is, he, no. if he don't allow me to do this, this means that this is probably attack, because why he don't allow me to uh, send uh, back? Yeah, but rebalancing goes over multiple channels, right? Sorry? So rebalancing goes over multiple channels. So yeah, you, rebalancing. So yeah, you have to yeah, do rebalancing uh, faster than the attacker would be sending. And that's kind of, yeah, as I said, there, there is something. But also, uh, yeah. you said uh, rebalancing with others. The problem is actually a civil problem because how does a node know that not all the other identities are belonging to the same adversary, right? So. 
<laughs> That's uh, the simple thing, yeah. Okay, awesome. We're uh, right on time. Uh, please give Elias a big round of applause.